All right, dynamic signals, because they happen over time um, and are oftentimes analog in nature initially, tend to have a ton of information. And so a big part of dealing with dynamic signals is learning to process them, to make that massive data into something that's usable. And so we'll talk here about the process of signal processing. So unlike a static signal, dynamic signal contain a bunch of information. So if you look at this image here, and uh, actually <laughs> don't know what this information is, um, but it, let's imagine this is uh, information about uh, sound uh, over time. So that this is um, tells us the level of sound at different frequencies as we move uh, through time in the left to right direction. There is a ton of information here, right? At each one of these different moments in time, we've got different frequencies that are being engaged at different amplitudes. Trying to make sense of that is really, uh, would be very difficult. Um, and so we go through the process of reducing that data. And so that's why we call that process data reduction. Uh, we also sometimes call that signal processing. It's a way to, to take a mass of uh, basically ununderstandable information and turn it into a number or a plot or something that we can show to other people. Now, uh, we're gonna talk about four different ways of processing a signal. There are a bunch of other different ways, uh, but the probably four most common are discretization, um, turning an analog signal or into a discrete signal, uh, statistical analysis, um, using standard deviation and mean and tools like uh, that on a dynamic signal, uh, filtering and time averaging to get rid of uh, noise and unnecessary uh, parts of the signal. Uh, and then a transformation to a frequency domain uh, in which we kind of break a signal down and talk about it in terms of what makes up that signal, what things are added together to get that uh, complex signal. Uh, this one we're going to address discretization because we're going to do that with almost any uh, signal we have. It's very difficult to deal with analog signal uh, and so we must always uh, discretize them. So as we said, most signals are analog uh, and we wanna try and turn those into um, a nice uh, analyzable computer discretized signal. Uh, so there's something nice about an analog signal. It's actually what the physical world is, as this little yellow guy says, uh, you know, audio files who like their vinyl records, like that's, an, that's analog sound. Uh, when we put it on a CD or stream it as an MP3, we've turned that into a digitized signal uh, and there's a loss of information there. Um, and that may or may not have, a, have an effect. I'll let you argue with your audio file friends about whether vinyl, <laughs> vinyl is better than streaming. Uh, but it is inarguable that we're taking something away. We're reducing uh, the information in an analog signal uh, to something uh, smaller in a, dis in a discretized signal. Okay, so um, we have two things to deal with. One is how we do that in time, that is on the x-axis. Uh, how do we discretize the x-axis? Uh, and that has to do with what's called sampling, deciding what time points we're gonna take the data. Uh, and then we have to discretize our amplitude too, that discretize our y-axis um, so that again, we can uh, computerize that. So look at sampling. So in sampling, sampling is the process of here's our analog signal uh, going up and down, choosing what points here we're actually going to record data um, in our discretized signal. So turning an analog signal into a discrete, time discretized signal. We need to think about a couple of different uh, variables and vocabulary here. One is a sampling count. So how many data points are we gonna take? Taking um, a huge number of data points, uh, your computer can probably handle it, uh, but it's onerous. Uh, so we don't wanna take too many data points. We wanna take enough to get the information we need without leaving us with these gigantic um, piles of information. It is data reduction, that's the purpose here. Time interval defines in some ways what that sampling count is gonna be, how far apart um, are our data points gonna be. That's the little delta T here. Sampling rate is the inverse of uh, time interval. So time interval is sort of the period of your sample. 
uh, sampling rate is the frequency of your sample. So we talk about, we can talk about a signal having a frequency, and this gets a little confusing, uh, but we also talk about our sample having a, a uh, frequency, right? And so if I'm, my sampling rate is 100 hertz, that means I'm taking 100 data points per second. And then finally, this is where we compare those things. We can talk about an input frequency or a maximum input frequency. Um, and it's important that we understand the relationship between these two. We want that sampling rate, as we'll see in a second, to be faster than our input frequency. Um, here, the difference is like, you know, if we look at this, we're taking 10 data points in one cycle. That's good enough to capture the shape of this analog signal. If we just took two data points, nah, you know, it gets shaky. If we took one or less than one for each cycle, then you start to run into trouble. Okay, and so here we can talk about the sampling theorem that defines that. And what, what our basic rule is going to be is that our sampling frequency has to be at least two times bigger than our input frequency. Okay, so if our signal is changing, uh, you know, say we're vibrating, vibrating a beam and it's vibrating 10 times a second, we want to sample that at least 20 times a second uh, in order to get that, uh, in order to get good data. So here you can see the gray line is actually sort of hidden. The real signal is underneath here uh, and that's a 10 hertz signal, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 cycles in one second. Our sampling frequency is 100 hertz, okay? So if we counted the little dots here, which I won't <laughs> do, you'd see that there are 100 dots there. We've taken 100 uh, data samples during that. Um, and that gives us a really nice, if we draw lines between our sample data points, we get a really nice picture of what that signal looks like, a pretty accurate image of. We capture most of the amplitude, not all of it, right? Because um, we're a little short, you know, the, the, you can see that gray peak out at the top here. So the input signal, has, signal actually has a slightly higher amplitude than our uh, discretized signal does. Uh, but we're getting pretty close. So that's our, here our sampling frequency is 10 times uh, what our input frequency is. Okay. If we break this rule, uh, we start to run into trouble. We can actually get a, what are called alias frequencies uh, that mislead us about what the, the signal itself is doing. So here you have a same 10 hertz input signal. This is the beam vibrating 10 times per second. If we only took what 12 hertz, 12 samples in a second, uh, we get you know a data point here, we get a data point here. We're just spacing these out. This is one twelfth of a second. That's one twelfth of a second, one twelfth of a second. And we get a discretized signal that looks like these dots here. And then when we drew a line, you know, fit a curve to that, we'd say, oh, look, that's a nice, you know, whatever, one and a half um, hertz signal. Uh, so we'd actually be misreading it because we weren't using a fast enough sampling rate. So you want to make sure you use a fast enough sampling rate. Again, you don't want to use a super fast sampling rate because you're going to end up with a data that's going to clog up your analysis and your and your computer. Um, so we want to balance between making sure we capture our signal and get the meaningful information out without giving ourselves too much of a, a pile of data. All right. We also want to discretize the amplitude. Uh, and where the idea here is to limit loss as well. Okay. Um, so in a computer, uh, everything's going to come down to either a zero or one. There's no 0 0.2578. Okay. Uh, and so if our signal, uh, you know, our conversion, our input signal is 2.7, ideally our output would be 2.7, but there is no such thing on a computer. At some point, we have to quantitize this. We have to quantize the levels here. Uh, and that means uh, our signal gets discretized. So in this conversion, a uh, reading of one gives us an output of one, but a reading of 1.7 also gives us an output of one. And so that's how we're discretizing this. Uh, and you can see the error there, right? We're losing some information there. Uh, and we just wanna be careful about that. Now, 
Um, this is the process of analog and digital conversion here uh, that you can see here. Um, and we have to go through that process. The levels of quantization, in other words, the sort of gap here, um, is tend to be pretty small. So it's not um, something that we worry a ton about. We call that quantization error, like that loss of, um, of, of information there. But on modern equipment, that tends to be pretty small. It tends to show up as noise, right? Because sometimes, well, not in this case, but uh, most of the times, if you're a little bit below the level, uh, you're going to get a reading of one. A little bit below, you know, above two, you're going to get a reading of two. Um, and uh, so you're not actually, uh, so you can't tell with any given data point, is this higher than that, the input value or lower? Uh, but it shows up as kind of random error. We don't have to worry too much about uh, quantization error. The thing we do have to worry about is called saturation error. Uh, and that is where our input signal gets outside the range of our instrument. So if in this instance, if my input was um, three and a half volts, I get a reading of three in binary digits when one is three. But then if I have four and a half volts, I get a reading of three. If I get five and a half volts, I get a reading of three. And that's called saturation. And that's no longer, this, that data is no longer telling us anything meaningful uh, about our input signal. Uh, and it can happen on the bottom too, right? We can get a reading of zero um, it, when our input is actually below zero. Um, but if you find that you have saturated data, you have to retake your data. It's, it's just simply not um, providing you anything that's useful. And so be careful about that. Um, you want to make sure you understand what the range of your instrument is and make sure that your input isn't going outside of that range because it can be frustrating <laughs> to have to redo all that.